Hello and welcome to this module where we're now going to focus on the high level view of Microsoft Azure. And with that, to begin our journey, let's jump straight into the cloud terms in the industry. You need to understand these terms first of all, so that you can better understand where cloud fits, how people are using cloud, etc. Cloud service models are probably the most fundamental item here. Number one, we have the concept of infrastructure as a service. Number two, we have platform as a service, also known as PaaS. And number three, we have software as a service, often referred to as SaaS. Now, what matters about these? How are they different? Well, infrastructure as a service, think about that as the concept of providing infrastructure on demand. These could be compute, storage, networking components that are provided up to you as a service. You request them and they're delivered to you as a service. Platform as a service builds upon that and says, okay, now we're going to offer up some application development frameworks and other managed services like SQL databases, etc. And software as a service takes that even further. And you'll learn more about those in a moment, but those are the cloud service models. In addition, we have deployment models. You've probably heard of private cloud, public cloud of which Microsoft Azure, AWS, GCP are key public cloud providers. And then we have the hybrid model as well. Now, what's the difference between all these three? Well, private cloud is about building those capabilities on the left, but in your own data center. So this could be building automation around things like VMware to provide virtual machines as a service. It could be building other things on premises that you want to offer up. Maybe you build databases as a service through additional automation. The difference being compared to public cloud, in the public cloud, somebody else is doing a lot of those tasks for you. As you again, you'll see more about shortly. Hybrid cloud is the best of both worlds and frankly, where a lot of enterprises are today. When I work with a lot of customers out there, the predominant method is hybrid today. So they probably have an on-premises data center and are looking to extend into the public cloud, use some of those advanced capabilities. Perhaps they're in the public cloud, but they have specific workloads that need to run more locally, perhaps in edge locations or in a local data center. Last but not least, we have essential cloud characteristics. What are the key things that mean we can say we are providing cloud services? And it's really these five. Number one, self-service, the ability to go to a portal, request that service for ourselves. We don't have to put a ticket in with IT for then IT to go and request it from someone else and get you know networking, storage, everybody involved. No, nope, we have self-service through a portal and then that hands off to automation. Heavily automated is a key cloud characteristic. We don't wanna put a ticket in and then wait for all these different teams to build everything for us. We wanna put our ticket in, put our request in through a portal, request that service and it be delivered to us almost instantaneously where possible. Resource pooling is another key thing. The public cloud providers, often now known as hyperscalers as well, pull significant amounts of resources, have massive data centers. They're pooling lots of compute storage network together and are able to disperse that, share that, you know, with the consumers of the cloud services. Next, we have elasticity. This is our ability to essentially scale on demand so we can add more resources as we need them, perhaps in response to a workload that has seasonal demand, maybe that application is getting hit pretty hard, it can scale automatically, uh, or perhaps we can scale on demand. Last but not least, we have measured and meter. This is all about cost transparency, knowing what you're using, what you're consuming, Think similar to your electricity meter. When I'm using lots of electricity, I'll get charged for that. When I'm not using it, I will not. Now there's all different pricing models and everything there, but this is one of the core cloud characteristics. So you can experiment with services, turn them off if you're not using them, use a service more, pay a little more for it, upgrade your CPU, pay a little more for it. Not using as much CPU, downgrade it, pay a little less for it, right? There's all sorts of options to tweak your workloads to get the best bang for your buck there. To expand on those cloud service models though, let's take a deeper look in them. So for one, we have on-premises. Think about when you did things in the data center, you have your network, your storage, your servers, your virtualization layer from say VMware and Microsoft with Hyper-V. You have your operating systems, your middleware, your runtime, your data and your applications, and you're ultimately responsible for all of this. Essentially though, as we move into infrastructure as a service in the public cloud, we're taking away those bottom four areas there. They're managed by the vendor now. The vendor is going to put the physical switches in, the storage arrays in, the servers in, and they are going to manage the virtualization layer. Now we can still build virtual machines, but we're responsible for the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the applications and data that live on top of them. The layers at the bottom are managed by the vendor. Now that's not to say that we don't have configuration to do in them, we absolutely do. We have software defined networks to configure, we choose what storage we want to allocate to our virtual machines and allocate to object stores. 
Those are things that we configure, but they're not physical items that we manage. We don't have to go into the data center. That is all managed by Microsoft in the case of Azure. As we move up further, now we can start to say, well, I don't even want to manage the operating system anymore. I want someone else to give me the runtime to put my application on. Now with PaaS, Platform as a Service, we're taking more of that responsibility giving it to the vendor. We're still responsible for our applications and data. We're going to code those applications. We're going to create those data models that will run on top there, but all that underlying you know, infrastructure and components are managed for us. Last but not least, we have SaaS. Now this one can be a little bit confusing. Essentially, you offload in all the application data models, everything, onto the public cloud provider that's providing that. That could be something like Salesforce, which your sales team uses. That could be something like ServiceNow. Now, it's not to say that you don't own the data that's running in those applications that are on SaaS. That's not to say that you don't do elements of configuration, but for the most part, you're not coding the applications. You're not creating the database schema and models. In many cases, you're consuming from the SaaS provider. In some cases, some of those providers allow you to tweak some of those things so the lines can get a little bit blurry. But for the most part, think that you're consuming the entire service. You're not writing the application. You're consuming it, you're using it, and you're you know, adapting it for your business. Now, all of this wouldn't be possible without massive scale data centers. Microsoft has a fantastic YouTube video around their data centers. In fact, if we jump over and search for Azure Ignite Data Center, we should see a video here. It is Inside Azure Data Centers with Mark Rasanovich. I encourage you to take a look at this YouTube video. Uh, Mark goes through a whole bunch of you know, key components of the Azure Data Center, and there's also a follow-on where he talks about the Azure servers as well. Now, this is a 20-minute video you can watch, uh, but really, really interesting just to see how Microsoft builds and scales out those data centers. Moving on from data centers, it helps to look at the regions that are available to you. This is where Microsoft puts those Azure data centers. There's currently 61 regions at time of recording, more than AWS and Google combined. So pretty impressive how well they've scaled out. Key thing here is you can deploy workloads all across the globe. There's no real restrictions there unless you choose to impose them. You can choose which regions you want to allow people to provision into. And regions are paired as well. That's where Microsoft does their maintenance. They do one region first then the paired region. And this is for disaster recovery and business continuity. So you can deploy workloads, say in East US, maybe your recovery region is on the West Coast. And then you know that, yep, if something completely went wrong in the East Coast region and you failed over to the West Coast, that wouldn't be a problem. And also you can have workloads where, you know, you've got front-end web servers all across the globe taking in traffic, you know, for local users. Perhaps users from Australia want to access a website, they will hit a server in Australia compared to American users would hit something in America. America. With that said, though, you know, lots of regions, lots of choices, you know, base them on your application workloads. Moving on, it's time to look at Microsoft's view of IaaS, PaaS, etc. And you can see here on the bottom, we have our data center infrastructure. That's those regions we just talked about. And then above, we have those infrastructure services. Think of this as the infrastructure as a service layer. Microsoft offers up virtual machines, containers, storage solutions, and networking services. So think about this as building your network layer, your storage layer, your compute layer. Above that, Microsoft uses a lot of these services to provide some of the platform services available. These could be services like serverless compute, distributed compute, web and mobile options here, web apps, you know, API apps, mobile backends data services such as relational SQL databases. So instead of you and to build a machine, install SQL on it, you can consume that as a service. They have other developer services. You've probably heard of Azure DevOps by now. And there's also media content delivery network services, analytics, IoT, etc. Not going to go through all of these individually. The main point here is you would choose the services for your particular application and you would analyze and figure out what you need to meet the demands of your business. A lot of these services you're probably already using in your data centers today. You're just buying the software off the shelf, installing it, and then customizing it and then using it. You know, in many cases, your app teams are using it. Moving on to the right-hand side, we've got the hybrid operations. So things like Active Directory, Server Backup, etc. Those are hybrid services. They often work on-premises and in the public cloud. So think of these as services that perhaps will manage your virtual machines on-premises as well. The directory, the Azure Active Directory is now a key component. In fact, as we flip to the other side, security and management, 
Microsoft continues to provide a lot of management tools as well to manage all of this. We've got a lot of platform services, infrastructure services, data center services. How do we manage? How do we get visibility into all of this? And that's what the security and management layer is there. In addition to automation services, encryption services, all these pieces to give you, you know, a secure and manageable public cloud footprint. Another great example to look at is AzureCharts.com. This is a restaurant menu style guide to Azure, and they also have all the services broken down by those key areas as well. So you can go here, you can tour around, you can see when these services were last updated, you can see when they have outages. It's a fantastic website. If we go back a page though, the restaurant style menu is a great way to get into Azure. You can see we've got the starters. Yeah, these are sort of our starter services where you might start with virtual machines, Azure Active Directory, VPN Gateway, Load Balancer, Azure Storage of Managed Disks being other common ones. So think about this as where you probably want to focus if you're just getting into it and then move on to your main dishes where you've got all these really interesting services. And then if you wanna get really, really creative, move on to the desserts, look at services like machine learning, Microsoft Genomics, really, really interesting options available to you there to get really, really creative on. Now with that said, let's continue to peel back the onion. Yeah, let's go into infrastructure as a service a little bit more. We have the concept of compute, which we'll get into virtual machines and scale sets shortly. We have disks, this is the managed disks icon here. So you'll have disks that will be associated with your virtual machines and our virtual machines probably need to be connected to a network so they can talk to other virtual machines. And this is the virtual network icon here. As we expand on VMs, you've got this concept of cattle versus pets. The virtual machine, the single machine that must be individually managed is definitely the pet in the scenario. This is where we have to individually manage it, take care of its configuration. We can't redeploy it easily unless we add on infrastructure's code and additional automation capabilities. But contrast that to a virtual machine scale set where identical machines are easier to build for large scale services, targeting things like big compute, big data, containerized workloads, and also just web applications that maybe need to scale up and down on demand as well. If something goes wrong, perhaps a machine just gets taken out, another one spins up, perhaps based on demand. Lots and lots of options with the virtual machine scale set, but you're treating them more as cattle. You've got a software configuration you know can be redeployed at ease, and therefore you can terminate any you know misbehaving virtual machines and then redeploy a working one or just in accordance with scale. If we go into basic storage services, you've got that managed disk icon I just showed. That's a simplified disk that could be a hard drive or an SSD for virtual machines. And then you've also got your storage account. This is tables, queues, files, blobs, and our Azure virtual machine disks can also be stored in a storage account as well. So think of that as a giant five petabytes of storage that you can provision on demand, but then you can choose different services from the storage account to use. In addition, if we expand out those network components, in addition to the virtual network, we've got the network card. That's a software defined construct that's attached to your virtual machine. We can create public IP addresses. We can create network security groups, which operate like firewalls. And then we can also operate a route table if we want to direct traffic, perhaps through a more advanced firewall if we want to. An example of a N tier infrastructure is something like this. On the top, we have our public IP address. All of those subnets are located in a standard virtual network here. We've got a front end network, 10.0.1.0 slash 24, middleware, 10.0.2.0 slash 24, and the back end network, 10.0.3.0 slash 24. VM01 is on IP address there, 10.0.1.5, and can talk to VM02, which in turn can talk to VM03, and they have network security groups protecting traffic between them. And in this example, we're showing the disks on the right-hand side. Those would be associated with the virtual machine. So very quickly to deploy a virtual machine stack, an NTS stack, much like you would on-premises. As you expand on that, you may wish to include additional networking components. Perhaps you want global scale, you would introduce a traffic manager. So traffic coming in could be redirected to a specific region, an application gateway to provide some additional web-based security and load balancing, or just a standard load balancer as well, which is the icon on the right. And then your infrastructure architecture might look something like this. The traffic might come in, hit a traffic manager, and then go to one of the two load balancing options on the left and right, perhaps based on region. One region could be the VNet01 on the left, which is in a specific region, perhaps East US, and a VNet02, maybe that's in West US. So the traffic comes in, 
hits the load balancers or hits the traffic manager, then hits the load balancers. And then that will in turn hit those servers in those respective regions. And then that will perhaps hit a load balancer to hit another scale set on the back end. So you can see here that we've got the ability, not single virtual machines here, virtual machines that scale up and down. And there's load balancing technology in between to make sure that load is balanced between those front end and back end services as well. And not forgetting, we also have that network security group. With that, to end off, I'm going to leave us here on azurecharts.com. I encourage you to go take a look, browse around the services. Also take a look at the Azure website as well. They have a good guide too, but I think you'll find this much easier to get around and sort of explore what's available to you there. And then, as mentioned, start off with the starter services, learn about virtual machines, learn about scale sets, learn about networks, storage, and you'll continue to advance on your Azure journey.